Hi, and thanks for watching. I'm Cassidy Lichtman. This might not be the typical talk you would hear about education, probably because I'm not the typical person who speaks about education. When I graduated from Stanford, I became a professional volleyball player. I went directly to play for the U.S. national team and for pro leagues around the world, which is how I found myself at one point, living and playing in the middle of Azerbaijan. If you can't quite recall where that is, I've included a map for you. My teammates in Azerbaijan were from every corner of the world. So we would be on bus rides on the way to a game, and there'd be a conversation happening in English, one in Spanish, one in Italian, one in some mix of Serbian and Croatian, and then my poor Korean teammate who couldn't really talk to anybody. <laughs> and you might think that that would be a pretty dysfunctional team. And yet, there we were, playing in one of the top leagues in the world. Now how does that work? Well, you find the commonalities, no matter how small. You take the differences as an opportunity to learn something new. And when in doubt, you give a lot of smiles and high fives. Coming out of that space, I couldn't help but wonder, how many workplaces could I walk into that look like that? How many spaces are there in our country at all right now where I could have that kind of positive interaction with somebody who's that different than me? America's increasingly divided, socially, economically, and politically. This is Congress within my lifetime. I was born in 1989 when, apparently, we used to work across party lines sometimes. And we can see over time how it's gotten more and more disparate. There were two reports that came out last year. The Global Wealth Report found that the top 1% of people held almost half of the world's wealth. And the US Census Bureau found that income inequality in the US is the highest that it's been in the last 50 years. This might be one of the factors. These are the aggregate percentages, the number of tech workers by race and ethnicity for four of the major tech companies. Now, Anybody who works in tech will tell you that the lack of diversity is a problem. And yet, since 2014, there has been no significant increase in the percentage of underrepresented minorities. We've done slightly better on gender. We're now at 22% women in these companies, which, sadly, is a significant increase. There are many factors that go into this, of course. But the one that interests me is, what are the cultural barriers to equity? All of the internalized biases and attitudes that were taught throughout our lives that make some people feel like they belong and some people feel like they don't. Healing those divides is a generational cultural challenge and we have to play the long game. It's not enough to teach kids computer science and calculus, the technical skills and knowledge that they need to do these jobs. If we don't teach kids new skills around things like empathy and empowerment, then we're going to raise another generation that perpetuates the societal divides and toxic workplace company cultures that we see right now, which not only takes away opportunities from underrepresented groups, but deprives these industries of huge sections of the talent pool. Now, many teachers are working on this and trying to embed social emotional learning in classrooms. And I don't think we can just dump all of this on traditional educators because they do still have to teach computer science and calculus and you know the entire history of the world. So what we wanted to do is look at what are the other opportunities to educate kids outside of the traditional classroom. Sports are the largest extracurricular activity in the US for youth. There are 30 million kids or more playing sports in this country. And we know that a fraction of 1% of them are going to go pro in their sport. But all of them are going to grow up to be adults in our society. So before they get there, can we teach them how to positively interact with and value people who are different than them? Can we teach young boys to become empathetic men and young girls how to be confident leaders? And can we teach all young people regardless of race or gender or any other characteristic, that they belong in all sectors and in positions of leadership. That's why I created PATH, 
which is a new learning pathway to teach the skills of empathy, equity, and empowerment to middle school and high schoolers. And as I was starting PATH, the first thing I thought about was, what do we already know? As we just talked about, we know the challenge, we know what kids need to learn, and we know where they are. Yes, kids are in classrooms all across the country. And they spend a lot of time outside the classroom. And for some kids in those spaces, they have a different kind of emotional buy-in and a vested interest in their own success. I was lucky enough to hear Gloria Simon speak one time. And the advice that she gave to the movement she was speaking to was gather and gather often. And I couldn't help but think, well, the kids are gathering. The networks within youth sports are vast and densely connected. There are spaces all over the country that look like this. And just as importantly, there are spaces all over the internet where youth athletes, their coaches, and their parents are gathering in huge numbers. Each of these networks, whether they're professional coaching development, or the sites where kids and their parents are going to learn news about their specific prep sport. Each of them not only has their following, the people who come to their sites, they have direct email lists that reach out once every week or two to their membership. That's a content distribution network that has gone untapped across sports by everyone except for advertisers. They know where the kids are. I think it's time that we use those channels for something besides selling the latest shoe. So we know where they are. We also know what influences their behavior. I was talking to a mom recently who had brought her daughter to a UCLA volleyball game this fall. A couple of the seniors had stayed after the match to sign autographs and her daughter on the way home was raving about getting to meet her hero. Now, mind you, this was her daughter's first ever college volleyball game. She had never heard of this player before in her life, but still, instant hero status. The voices of the role models that her kids are looking up to in sports are invaluable. And being able to couch the principles and lessons of social emotional learning in those voices can amplify them exponentially. Once again, you know who's using this concept successfully? The advertisers. We know that this works. We know that they've been able to shift attitudes and behaviors. So let's consider what it is that we're trying to sell. But we don't just want to influence kids' behavior. We want them to actually learn new skills. And thanks to many educators out there who have done the work, we know how kids learn best. We know that it takes short, frequent repetitions, that it helps if the content is relevant to their interests and if they're able to learn by doing. And we know that it helps them to have an opportunity to reflect and get feedback. And we're actually pretty good at some of these things in sports. Nobody's ever walked into a room and said, open up your books, let's learn how to play soccer today. So we took all of those things that we already know into account when creating PATH. I decided to take the two incredible and underutilized resources in the sports world, the voices and platforms of the role models that kids are looking up to, and the vast, densely connected networks within youth sports. We're creating a channel between those, a new learning pathway for educating the whole child and teaching the lessons that we know kids need to learn if we're going to transform the workplaces of the future. We've gathered a group of elite athletes and coaches from across the major pro leagues, college, and the Olympics. Legends of their game, like the Warriors, Steve Kerr, Queen of Softball, Sue Enquist, and 11-time Olympic medalist, Apollo Ono. They, and others like them, have agreed to film content for us. They'll be our educators. Now, we're not going to write a full curriculum around developing empathy building confidence, or anything else. Those exist already. We're going to break down those concepts into small, tangible lessons, each set in a two to three minute video 
featuring one of our elite athletes and coaches. They'll frame the lesson through their own voice and experience, and each one will have a couple takeaways. What are two things that you can think about and reflect on, or talk about amongst your team? And what are two ways that you as a young person can practice this skill? Because there's a lot of great messaging out there around many of these topics. Don't bully, be kind, be confident. And those are fantastic. And I think for many kids, they don't know how to draw the line between that message and their actual life and actions. We wanna help draw that line for them so that they not only understand that overarching message, but how they can practice that in their day-to-day -day life today in training or tomorrow when they go to school. Here's an example of our content featuring Sue Enquist. While we were at UCLA, one of the things we spent a lot of time on was the mind game. And when you have 15, 18 student athletes, everybody approaches it differently. And I think one of the things I want you to know is everybody is struggling with the voices in their head. And what does that sound like? Well, on your good days, you're like, oh, I got this. I own that opponent. I'm ready. That weak voice that always seeps in, you're not good enough. You're not strong enough. You're not smart enough. What are some of the things that you think about in your head? Have you ever listened to your strong voice or your weak voice? One of the things that you can do is a great activity, it doesn't take that long. Grab a piece of paper, on the left side put strong voice, on the right side put weak voice. And I want you to write down all your strong thoughts about yourself. Then on the other column, put your weak voice. I want you to write down all your weak voice statements. A quick tip to get better at your self-talk is what we call best friend advice. Have you ever been in those situations where your best friend comes up and she's got a problem or he's got a problem and you as the best friend say, hey, you're good enough, you're big enough, you're strong enough, you're so confident, you're so believable and you help your friend out. Isn't it crazy that we don't use our own best friend advice with ourselves? Start using your best friend advice and just remember, always let that strong voice get the last word and speak nicely to yourself. Each of these lessons is designed for a child to learn on their own or with a parent, but also for a coach who maybe only has 10 minutes once every week or two to focus on educating the whole child. Because we know that they have to spend most of their time teaching them how to hit or kick a ball. And then if the child or their parent or their coach wants to learn more, then we point them to those great people with the full curriculum. Our goal is not to compete in this space, but to amplify. So after we've created this content, how do we get it in front of kids? Three ways. The existing networks in youth sports, social media, and physical events. Rather than start my own network from scratch, I decided to use the existing infrastructure. We went to the types of networks that I talked about earlier and got agreements from them to just include our content in their existing outreach. In this way, we can scale from the outset. The networks that we have agreements with so far can reach 300,000 parents and coaches and 3 million kids. But we also want to reach kids in their native space, which is social media. We'll use our own accounts and those of our coaches and athletes in our network to push out our content and to run social media campaigns. Here would be an example. In this campaign, we would ask our athletes to post a picture or a video of themselves with a teammate or colleague from their organization who's different from them in some way. We want them to note the difference, but also note something that they agree on. We can teach kids that Whatever our difference is, we can still be on the same team. And finally, we want to use physical events. On any given weekend in this country, you can find a space that looks like this, with somewhere between 2,000 to 40,000 kids of different races, genders, socioeconomic backgrounds. We want to take advantage of two opportunities in these spaces. First, we want to bring in role models to speak in front of these kids and spread our messages. Role models from sports, yes, 
but from other industries as well, business, tech, entertainment. And as for the second opportunity, you know who I've seen recruiting at these tournaments? The Marines. You know who I haven't seen recruiting at these tournaments? Those tech companies with the abysmal diversity numbers we talked about earlier. So imagine if at the bottom of this picture, next to the bounce house, there was a STEM zone, a space with cool robots to play with and fun programming games, where the kids and their bored younger siblings could come between matches. Because a lot of the kids that I see at these tournaments might not be the ones who opt into STEM in the classroom. But maybe if we can bring it into the space where they're comfortable in an unintimidating way, then maybe the next time that they're at school and somebody asks, are you interested in robotics? Maybe they say, yes, I did that. I can do that. We have to change the cultural understandings around who does what. And sports have always been a driver of cultural change from Jackie Robinson and Billie Jean King to the way that Allen Iverson changed how a generation of kids dress. And if we coordinate it and provide some structure, we can use that power for a purpose. Because I want to live in a world where the first time somebody talks to a boy about respect is not in harassment training on the first day of his job. And I want to live in a world where a young woman walks into her first day on the job confident in her ability to lead and where everybody around her expects that of her. And I want to live in a world where a young kid in the inner city dreams about going to the NBA, but knows that their backup plan is coding the next NBA 2K. Now there are many ideas in education about how we can educate the whole child. But if we're going to educate the whole child, we need to consider the whole of the child, their spaces, their motivations, and all of the means for educating them. If you want to join us, you can visit our website at passports.org or email me at cassidy at passports.org. Thank you.